All right, little pop quiz here. Um, I want to know, uh, I never knew what this word, I never knew the, 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 the phrase for this. I never knew the medical term for this. There's a, a natural phenomenon that happens to all of us, um, and there's a medical term for it that um, I'd never heard before until I Googled it uh, for in preparation for this sermon. And I want to see, how many of you know this? Um, how many of you know um, what this describes, paresthesia? Anybody know what paresthesia describes? It's a common phenomenon that we've all experienced um, and next time that this happens to you, you can be like, oh my gosh, I'm experiencing paresthesia and it'll mess with somebody's head. But what's all, the, the only thing that's happened is your arm or your leg has fallen asleep, okay? Um, <clears throat> that is the medical term, the medical term for what happens when your arm or your leg proverbially falls asleep. Um, we've all felt that, right? You slept weird and uh, ironically, it's just, you're, it's really comfortable and then suddenly you realize it's not or you, you, know, you sit with your right leg crossed for a little bit too long and then suddenly you try to get up and you realize what happens. Oh, my leg, my arm has fallen asleep. And like me, maybe you thought it had something to do with blood circulation. That's what I always thought. Oh, I've been cutting off the blood circulation in my arm, my leg and that tingling sensation is the blood rushing back to my arm or my leg. Well, that wasn't true. That's actually not what's happening at all. Um, what's happening, um, thanks to WebMD and ChatGPT, um, uh, what's happening with paresthesia um, is um, the nerves that communicate from your arm or your, you know, to your brain or from your leg to your brain, those nerves are compressed. And over an extended period of time, whenever those nerves are compressed for too long, it cuts off the signal temporarily from your brain to your arm or to your leg. And so temporarily, what it fe- it's, it's as if your brain is not aware that that arm or that leg is actually a part of the body anymore. And what we call it is, well, my leg or my arm has fallen asleep. Um, but what's actually happening is it's as if your brain is no longer aware because of the compressed nerves that communicate um, with, between the arm and the brain that that arm is still actually there. And then when you start moving again, um, that tingling sensation isn't the, the, the nerves of the blood. It's the, like the brain almost reconnecting with the arm and knows, like, oh my gosh, there is a limb there. It's why um, if you've ever tried to walk when your um, legs asleep, it's a very dangerous thing to do that, Okay. This has never happened to me before, but a a very dear friend of mine um, broke her leg because she got up and tried to walk on a leg that was asleep, okay? So that's your warning, okay? Don't do that. If you learn anything today, it's unsafe to walk with it. And why? Again, this makes sense. It's like your brain isn't aware that it's there, so you're putting weight on something that it is there, but the brain doesn't realize it's there. It's a crazy thing, um, but it is still there. You put weight on it, and then boom, something back happens. Again, you know this, right? Um, Your body and my body, um, whenever our arm or leg is asleep, it can't fully function the way that it was intended to function until our arm or our leg proverbially wakes up. I wanna talk about that for a few minutes today. As we close out our series um, that we've been in called Sleeping Giant, Sleeping Giant, Unleashing Our Potential for good. And what we've said that a sleeping giant is, okay, by way of definitions, a sleeping giant is a person, an entity, or organization with immense unrealized potential that for whatever reason, um, a, a, an entity, a person, organization, it just lays dormant. It is not realizing its full potential. And what I've said in this series is that I believe that the church in North America is a sleeping giant, that I believe the church Um, has far more potential than what we are currently seeing. And I believe our potential is far better and greater than the current reality of things. And by the church, by the church, I don't mean our building, okay? Because our church, it is a building, okay? Our church has a physical location. Our church has an address. You can GPS here. But by church, the sleeping giant I am describing is the body. Because the church that Jesus established, the ecclesia that Jesus launched after his resurrection is a body, um, if you ever heard the term the body of Christ, that's what this is. It's the church. Um, and that's not, a, could sound like a weird thing if you're new to church or new to faith, or maybe you've never heard that term before, but it just means this, that the body of Christ are followers of Jesus that are called to be representatives of who Jesus is in this world and on this earth. As his body, we are to represent what was true of Jesus to this world, okay? We've said this, what was true of Jesus should be true of his body. What was true of Jesus should be true true of me and you as his body, as his followers. And when it is not, when it is not, when we as the church, 
the, the body of Jesus, the body of Christ, the representatives of Jesus here on this earth, when we fail to represent who he was, when we fail to represent his heart, when we fail to represent his love, when we fail to represent his kingdom values, the church does more harm than good. That when we fail to represent who Jesus was accurately throughout the gospels to the world around us today, um, we get to where we are today, which is the church's reputation statistically um, is lower than it's ever been in our country. And, and um, trust, trust in religious institutions and the church, a part of that is statistically lower than it has ever been in our country. Um, and Christians are labeled um, as mean and polarizing and, um, and hateful and ignorant. Um, that when we get this wrong, the church does more harm than good. But when we get this right, when we as the church, as the body of Christ, represent who Jesus was and is well, we unleash a good that shows the world the goodness of our King, the beauty of his good news and gospel, and the glory of his way that he has called us to follow. And this way, this way um, is all centered on, and we talked about this in week one, his radical ethic of love that flipped the first century upside down and every century since then. That when followers of Jesus get this right, that when followers of Jesus lean into this radical ethic of love that teaches us to love our enemies, to bless those that persecute us, um, to put ourselves second, to defer, to do for others as we would have them do to me, and to love as Jesus ultimately as he taught right before he was to be crucified. Love others as I have loved you. In other words, there is no limit to your unconditional love to the world around you. That when we get this right, when we follow in the way of Jesus and lean into this radical ethic of love that we unpacked in week one, um, there is a flourishing that happens and we unleash a good in this world that shows just how good God is. This is what Paul talks about. Again, um, just to kind of catch us up a little bit, um, Paul Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 13, verse eight. He says, let no debt remain outstanding. As Christians, pay your debts, leave no debt between you and anybody else, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The only debt that should remain outstanding in the life of a Christian is a debt that you can never pay off. It's a debt that is never done. It is your indebtedness and my indebtedness to love one another, to love anybody on the other side of us. Why? Because that ultimately, he says, fulfills the law. And then a couple verses later, he says, so I want you to do this. I want you to love with this kind of love. I want you to show this kind of love to the world, understanding the present time. He writes, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believe. That the Apostle Paul writing this letter to the church in Rome saying, hey, the, the, the hour has come, meaning the time is now. The time is now for us to live out and lean into this ethic of love, the love of God that fulfills the law. It is time for us as the church, as his followers, as his body, to wake up from our slumber because there is work to be done. There is love to be shown and good to be unleashed. And there's this passion and this urgency that Paul wrote with to the church in Rome. Why? Because there's limited time. He says this interesting phrase that our salvation is near today than it was when we first believed. Um, th this might sound a little bit weird because this was written so long ago, but um, the church in Rome and our church today, we exist in the same period of salvation history, okay? Um, you've got the, the resurrection of Jesus, and then what we believe, and I don't have time to get into this, um, but the scriptures, the New Testament teaches us that one day Jesus is going to return to restore all things and to repair and restore this broken world to what it was before sin derailed everything. So you've got post-resurrection and before the return of Jesus. The church of Rome exists in that time and we, our church, now exists in that same time. And Paul says that the, the day of Christ's return is near today than when we first believed. It was true then and it's true now. And in the meantime, there is work to be done. And each of us, each of us have a part to play in that work that God wants to do in this period of history and in our lifetime. And that's what I wanna talk about for a few minutes today, okay? Collectively, collectively, we are the body. Collectively, we are the body of Christ. But individually, we each have a part to 
play. And what I want to do for the next few minutes, I want to weave in and out of two different passages that Paul, um, that Paul wrote that teach these two things. It kind of gives us a theology of this idea that collectively we are the body, but individually we each have a part to play. We're going to jump into Romans chapter 12, then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, then back to Romans chapter 12, then back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, okay? I'm going to walk us through, and we're basically going to, it's where in these two passages, Paul talks about these ideas right here. Um, and we're going to string together a theology and an understanding of collectively we are the body, but individually we each have a part to play. So Romans chapter 12, this is just before Romans chapter 13, where he tells the church in Rome to wake up from their slumber. He writes this in Romans chapter 12, verse four, for just as Each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, okay? So anatomically, right, he's saying, hey, this is obvious, Paul, okay, cool, we get it. Our body made up of many parts and all the parts have different functions. You got your hand, your foot, your fingers, your ears, your nose, okay, head, shoulders, knees and toes, first century right here. This is where it started, okay? Um, And they've all got different functions, Anatomically, okay, tracking with you, Paul, that makes sense. So then he goes on. So in Christ, meaning those that are relationally connected to Jesus, those that are part of the body of Christ. So in Christ, we, though we are many, though we are made up of individuals, though we are many, we form one body and each member belongs to all the others, that we have a unity because of our common faith. Many members, one body, just the same as your body, many members, but one body and a common faith binds us. And he says, and we have different gifts. We have different gifts. In other words, we have different functions according to the grace given to each of us. So just as the body, like anatomically, has many parts um, and they all serve different functions. There's a diversity of functions in the body, but it is one body. The same is true of the body of Christ. And this diverse set of functions um, in the body of Christ, the New Testament calls gifts. Or maybe if you grew up in church, they're called spiritual gifts. And here's the idea, that God has given each of us unique and specific giftings. That God has wired us uniquely with, with unique gifts and skills and abilities and talents. And some of those gifts and skills and abilities and talents, um, they might come very naturally to you. Like you're, you're gifted in certain areas and in certain ways. There are certain things that just come naturally to you that you're really good at. And then some of these gifts and skills and talents may have been cultivated over time. Um, but the, the point is the same, whether it comes naturally or something you had a knack for, or you've cultivated something over time. God God has given us these different gifts that as one body, we all have different functions. In other words, we all have different parts to play. Now, the purpose of these gifts, the purpose of these gifts, we're going to jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul also talks about um, the body and the gifts. There's multiple places, and he talks about it a little bit differently every time. So to give us a full picture, I kind of want to weave these together. Um, he tells us the purpose of these gifts, these gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You're going to hear, read some similar language because he's talking about the same thing. There are different kinds of gifts, okay, a diversity of functions within the body, but the same spirit distributes them. Um, you're going to see this, diversity and unity, Same God, one body, but different in many gifts. And he goes on, he kind of teases this out. He says, there's different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There's different kinds of ways that you can serve God and do his work and unleash the good in this world, but it's all the same God. Um, There are different kinds of working, but but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. There are different ways that you and I can work um, to unleash the good and build up the kingdom and build up the church. But again, we are all, it is the same God working in and through us. And then he he says this, he gives us the the, the purpose of these gifts um, in verse seven. He goes, now to each one, The manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. It's an interesting phrase here, the manifestation of the Spirit. A manifestation, quite literally, an action that embodies something. An action that embodies someone. And so in this context, what he is saying um, is that these gifts that we have, um, that they are meant, the manifestation of the Spirit, that whenever we lean into these gifts, um, we are showing the world in some way who God is. 
that these gifts, whenever they are put into action, we are embodying, in, in a sense, we are showing the world who God is. We are showing the world how good God is. That these gifts that we have, and this last, this last two words here, these gifts that we have, as, as, as the goodness of God is manifested in us and through us, as the goodness of God, as we leverage these gifts, is seen in us and through us, these gifts are to be leveraged for the common good for the common good, not for selfish gain, not to be seen as somebody special, um, not to build up our own little kingdoms, but they are be used for the common good to build up the church and to unleash the good in this world. So if I could kind of put a summary around it, our gifts, our gifts, these God-given gifts are meant to unleash good and show how good God is. They are to be used and leveraged for the common good. Our gifts are meant to unleash good and show how good God is. And you, as a follower of Jesus, are a part of the body. The gifts that you have, the gifts that you have, um, they are God-given. The skills that you have, they are God-given. The talents that you have, they are God-given. And Paul says, as a part of the body collectively, individually, we are called to use those gifts and to leverage those gifts to unleash good in this world that shows just how good our God is. And some of you need to hear this today, that you have a gift, that you are gifted, that, that, that you might not see it. And, and I'm gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at some examples here in just a second. But you have, you need to hear this. You have a unique contribution to make to the kingdom that Jesus came to establish. You have a unique contribution to make to ensure that this sleeping giant actually wakes up. You have a unique contribution to play in the body of Christ. It's not somebody else's job. It's not the church's job. It's not that person that you think is like more spiritual than you, more, more mature than you, knows more of the Bible than you do. You are uniquely wired, positioned, and created by God to make an impact as a part of the body. And so jumping back then to Romans 12, we're gonna pick up where we left off. Paul gets into some of what these gifts are, okay? So collectively, we are one body, um, just as the body has the, made up of many parts with diverse functions, the same is true of the body of Christ, okay? Um, then we've gotten into what is the purpose of these gifts for the common good, to unleash good and to show how good God is. So then what is an example of some of these gifts? Paul, jumping back to Romans chapter 12, he says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. Now, you're like, oh wow, we went straight into prophecy. Okay, I don't have that gift, okay? <clears throat> and you might be wondering, who thinks they do? Okay, wherever, wherever you are, okay, that, that's fine. Can I just, I wanna tell you, um, uh, there's different ways to interpret this um, and the different scholars interpret different ways. The way that I interpret this, um, the, the prophesying in the Old Testament was quite literally prophets speaking out the word of God. Uh, it's before we had the Bible. It's before it was all put together and we had what we now call the word of God. And so in the Old Testament, these prophets quite literally, they proclaimed the word of God. Um, in my studies and the way that I've been taught um, is that prophesying today is proclaiming the word of God. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> if I'd had a seminary professor that was like, hey, if you think you've got a word that should be added to the word of God, we might have a problem, okay? And so I'm gonna go with, with my seminary professors here. And so the way I interpret this is, hey, if you've got a gift at proclaiming the word of God, You've just got a knack um, for, 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 for proclaiming um, God's word to people. Um, you have a way of making that come to life. Then you should do so. You should do so. If that is a gift that you have, you should do this in accordance with the faith that you've been given. And he goes on. If it is serving, if you just, like you're always, again, the interesting thing about these gifts, in some ways, every Christian should do these things. But you know this, because some of these you're going to connect with. You're going to feel like, oh, these come naturally to you. Um, then that might be a gift. If, if it's serving, if you just have a natural knack for, like you just kind of can't sit still. This is my mom. Um, if she sees somebody doing something somewhere, she just wants to get up and help. <clears throat> the rest of us that are less like Jesus, just sit there and watch, okay? So... <clears throat> so if it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, like you've just got a knack for bringing, making connections for people and bringing to light things that are complex and helping people, then teach. You should teach. That's a gift. Um, if it is to encourage, like if you just, you all, you're so aware of how people are doing. You're just, you're so great um, at speaking life into people. You just have a way to do that. We, you might be that person. You know some of those people. If, if, then I want you to, in, to give encouragement, like lean into that gift. If it is giving, if it is giving, then give generously. 
Like, you know this, we're all called to give, but there are just some of us. You just have a, a gift of giving. Um, it might be because you have a, 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 um, a larger means to give than some other people, or it just might be that there is something that like you just, you look for opportunities to give, you love to give. It's something that brings you so much joy. Again, we're all called to do it, but for some of you, there's just this natural gift that you have of giving and you always find opportunities to do so in unique ways. So do it generously. If it is to lead, you've just got a natural knack for leadership um, that, that people follow you. You have influence to be leveraged um, and there is this, this kind of uh, magnetic thing to your leadership and, and people will follow. Well, then do that. Do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, again, you're like, well, who shouldn't show mercy? Everyone should show mercy. But for some of us, again, I could talk to you about my wife. She's way better at doing this than I am. Like, and I should do this. But if you are just wired, it just comes so naturally. It might be a gift and you got to lead the way. So do it cheerfully. He lists these gifts out. Now, a couple of things about this. There's multiple lists in the New Testament that Paul writes where he talks about these gifts or these spiritual gifts. Um, none of the lists are identical. They're different guys. In fact, I wasn't sure which one to read because they're all different, okay? Here's what that tells you. Because they're all different, none of them are exhaustive. So when Paul wrote these lists out, it wasn't like, okay, these are the only spiritual gifts that can do good in this world. I think Paul was writing about many of them and there are a bunch in the New Testament, um, but because none of the lists are identical and they're all going to different churches, that means it's not an exhaustive list of gifts. So that's means two things for us, okay? And this is, this is so important. We, this is so important. You've got, to, you've got to get this, okay? Because the list is not exhaustive, it means there's other gifts that Paul could have included in these lists, in the New Testament, the spiritual gifts, okay? Here's what I want you to know, the first thing. Any gift that you have, whether it's listed in any of the New Testament gifts or not, okay? Any gift that you have, any skill that you have, any talent that you have, anything that just comes naturally to you that you are really good at, okay? Anytime you use that gifting, anytime you leverage that gifting to unleash good in this world in the name of Jesus, it is a spiritual gift. Anytime you might be like, oh man, I'm not gifted. I guess God skipped me on the assembly line there. Uh, because none of those are me. Don't miss this. It's not an exhaustive list. That wasn't Paul's point. Any gifting you have, any skill that you have, any talent that you have, it is given to you by God and it has a greater purpose than maybe you've ever seen. And when you leverage that gift, when you leverage that talent in a way that brings glory to God and unleashes the good in this world in the name of Jesus, it is a spiritual gift. So you have a gift. Point number two, because it's not an exhaustive list, the point isn't the gift itself. Paul's emphasis here, whatever your gift is, use it. Whatever the gift is, unleash the good. Whatever the gift is, be aware of it and lean into it and play your part in the story because you are an indispensable part of the body that, that one of the things that is so easy to, that, that happens in the church, and we're all guilty of this, okay? We just kind of, we look to the, to the neighbor to do something, or it's like, okay, well, they'll, they'll do, or I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not special enough to, to be a part of that, or I don't really have any natural giftings. I'm just gonna kind of show up and do the church thing, okay? That's part of the problem um, in North America. What I hope is for us to wake up that as the body of Christ, every single one of you, you don't have to be a professional Christian that works at a church um, to leverage a gift to unleash the good in this world. Your part is indispensable to the body. Jumping back to 1 Corinthians 12, Paul shows us this, okay? So, um, he, he, so we've looked at the, the collective body, okay? We're all apart, what the purpose is, what these gifts are. And he says, and don't miss this, your part matters. So back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, so even so the body is not made up of one part, but many, okay? So what he's about to do is show you how important each part is. And he goes into kind of a funny kind of illustration to show this. He says, now if the foot... The foot should say, um, because I'm not the eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being that part of the body. If like the foot, if your foot could talk, that'd be interesting. <clears throat> I don't know what it would say. Um, give me some new insoles. Uh, but if the foot was just getting a little bit jealous, you know, man, I'm so, it's so hot down here. You know, like your, your socks are not comfortable. They got a thread count of a paper towel. Like you could have given me way something better down. Okay, like, if it was like, man, it'd be great to be an eye. 
You know, like help people see that sounds so much more important than my, than the foot. Like, it's just so hot down here. It's uncomfortable. You know, I don't like your shoes. If the foot were to say that, right? I mean, would it stop being a part of the body? No, it, it can't be. Or he goes on, if the ear, if the ear should say, hey, look, I, I'm not an eye. I do not belong to the body. Would it for that reason not stop, stop being a part of, of course not. If the, if the ear was like, man, you never, you never get the wax out. It's really uncomfortable in there. It'd be great to be an eye. Like you take care of your eyes. You put eye drops in them. I see that you have glasses. Like, man, you, you, there's a lot of you, beautiful eyes. Okay, like, man, it'd be so much better than the ear. No, it would, he goes on. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? Well, it's like he's giving a pep talk to the ear. Hey, ear, listen. Come on. Hey, buddy, we, we wouldn't be able to hear without you. You're doing such a great job, you know? Now, if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Like, come on, ear, we need you. We need you. Come on, we, come on. Where? But in fact, he says, but in fact, but in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. That God has placed you and God has positioned you and God has gifted you uniquely right where you are and for a unique and specific purpose. And whatever that part is, it matters. Whatever that part is, it is necessary. Whatever that part is, it is required to wake the sleeping giant. Paul goes on, if they were all, they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. This is so important. If it were all one part, where would the body be? There is a necessary diversity for the body to be a body. The body, unity, but there is a necessary diversity for it to actually be the body effectively and functionally. And the same is true for the body of Christ. There is a necessary diversity and all of us are gifted uniquely, diversely, while we're unified to unleash the good in our context. He goes on, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. In other words, there is nobody more important in the kingdom of God, there's nobody more important than somebody else. There's no Jesus follower more important than somebody else. I get up here and I get to preach with a microphone. I'm no important to the contribution of the kingdom than anybody else, he says. So Paul goes on, on the contrary, nobody can say that's ridiculous. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weakened, weaker, they're indispensable in the parts that think are less honorable. We treat with special honor. Here's the point that when God looks down at you and when God looks down at me and when God looks down at us, there is a necessary diversity in the body. And it takes every part to complete the body. It takes every part to play their part to wake the sleeping giant. The eye is important, but it is not the body alone. The hands and the feet, they're important, but they are not the body alone. Come on. Um, the people that work on staff at a church, the preachers, the pastors, they're important. Kind of. We're not the body alone. Come on. You've got people in your life that maybe they're a small group leader or a mentor or somebody like, man, that's like, they're, they're, they're the ones doing the work. Or maybe a, 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 someone that mentored you, an important part of your life, or you see some kind of person in this world, someone you look up to, and they're just like, man, they're doing the good work. They're not more important than you. They're not the body. They can't be the body, just like the eye can't be the body, just, just like the hand can't be the body. No, no, the body is the unity of diversity. And the same is true in the body of Christ. For the church, the representatives of Jesus here on this, world, on this earth, for us to unleash our maximum potential for good, to show the world how good God is. Every part has to be functioning because every part is indispensable. All parts are needed to be present, connected, and engaged. And back to my introduction. Don't be the part of the body that falls asleep. Don't be the part of the body that is completely unaware of your part in the story. Don't be the part of the body that downplays the ways that you are gifted and skilled. Don't be unaware. Don't downplay where God has positioned you and where you are and how he has wired you and even the passions that he has given you. 
because it is needed as a unique contribution to the work that the body of Christ is called to do in this world. Unleash the good and show how good God is as we build up the church in the kingdom that Jesus came to establish. Don't be the part of the body that falls asleep. Because just like you're hobbling around waiting for that foot to wake up, we need everybody wide awake for us to fully function in the way that God created the church to function. Because your gift is indispensable to the body. I hope some of you are encouraged by this. Your gift, you are not created just to wake up, go to church, and then live your life Monday to Saturday. No, no, your gift, it is indispensable to the body. And there is good work There is good work to be done through you. Who you are, how you are gifted, how you are wired, any gift or talent that you have that you just think was just by chance, it was just random. No, no, no. It was given to you. Whether it was cultivated over time, it was given to you. Whether it be leadership, encouragement. For some of you, you have this gift of prayer. It just comes so naturally. Whether it be wisdom or discernment, teaching. For some of you, it might look like evangelism or giving, mercy, serving. For some of you, it's hospitality. And that one is actually in the New Testament. So I didn't just make that one up. Oh, that's cute. No, hospitality. That's what I mean. I mean, whatever gift that you have, God wants you as a part of the body to leverage it to unleash good in the name of Jesus. Leverage it to do good and to show the world how good our God is. And big churches, big churches tend to, we, we, we get a lot of flack sometimes. Um, we get knocked on a lot, you know, big, not personal, yada, yada, yada. I'm not gonna get defensive in this moment. I'm gonna let it go. You're here. I'm preaching to the choir, okay? <clears throat> but can I just tell you um, just one of the amazing things about a big church, and I, just, I was preparing for this, it, just, it encouraged me so greatly. One of the incredible things about our church being so big is that when we all leave here, Monday to Saturday, there are not many places in the cities and the counties that our church comes from that is not touched by a follower of Jesus that is a part of this church. That Monday to Saturday, there are not many pockets. There are not many spaces because of how big our church is and the number you don't want to follow Jesus. There are not many places where there is not a person that is uniquely gifted by God that has a vision for unleashing the good in his name. There are not many, there's nowhere safe in the best possible way. There are not many places Monday to Saturday where there is not one of us somewhere ready to be salt and light in the name of Jesus. Leveraging the way that we've been uniquely gifted to unleash good in this world, to show how good God is. And the sleeping giant of the church wakes up when we all become convinced that we have a part to play. When we become convinced that our part is indispensable to the body that it's not just the church's job as an institution to carry on the kingdom program that Jesus came to establish, but each and every single one of us as we leave as the church, I said this week one, this church as a building has an address. The church has multiple addresses. It's wherever you are. But the sleeping giant wakes up when we as the church leave here and go out and live and be as the church and specifically playing our part and leveraging the way God has wired us for good to show how good he is. The sleeping giant wakes up. That we start to change the reputation of the church. We start to show people who Jesus is, how good his gospel is, and how beautiful his way is when we realize that the story God is writing in this moment in history is not moved along by a few, but by the body. So I want you to play your part because you have one and it is indispensable. So for us, we wanna wake the sleeping giant. The goal of this series has been to wake the sleeping giant. And as grandiose as it sounded, I mean it. I believe that this is a problem in the North American church and I want this church to begin to be a part of the solution. 
that for whatever reason, because the reputation is bad, that I'm not pointing fingers, but I wanna be a part of the solution. I'm not pointing fingers, but I wanna take responsibility. I want us to awaken here and I want us to be a part of the solution out there. So because we've been talking about kind of throughout the whole, the whole series and the way that series work, you're kind of teaching bits and pieces together. I figured it'd be helpful to kind of give us a, a series overview and a summary of what it looks like if we were to leave here today. Don't let this be just a sermon series that you just kind of showed up to, but let's wake the sleeping giant by way of review. And if you're taking notes, this is the moment right down, or maybe at the end of the slide, just take a picture. Number one, and we talked about this week one, in the following, there's a flourishing. That when we follow in the way of Jesus, there is a flourishing that happens. It is impossible, it is impossible otherwise, not because we're good, but because the way of Jesus is so good. And when followers follow, communities flourish, families flourish, even nations flourish. Whenever followers follow, good is unleashed. And that good reflects back up to how good our heavenly father is. In the following, there's a flourishing. Number two, so then, we said in week two, be salt and be light. Be salt and be light. Be salt. Christians should make things better. Like people should be glad that we are around. We should function as those that preserve the good in this world. And we should be light. Dispelling the darkness and illuminating the darkness. Living in what is true. Showing what is true. Standing up against what is evil and what is dark. And then today, knowing that your gift and the unique part you play is indispensable to the body. How you are gifted, where you are, you need to know. You can't, me talk, you can't talk me out of this. Don't come find me after the sermon. Hey, but listen, let me just tell you, I'm the one exception. No, you're not. If you are a part of the body, you're not an exception. Take it up with Paul. It's not, it's not my decision, okay? Because there is a good work, part four, number four, there's a good work to be done through you. And the sleeping giant wakes up when we individually decide, when we collectively decide individually to say, I'm gonna go play my part because I represent something bigger than me. I represent someone greater than me. And I want the world to see how good he is. So I'm gonna make sure good is unleashed through my life. Part one, I showed you guys this quote by Napoleon Bonaparte. He's a famous French military leader and politician. And the quote, the historians are split whether or not he actually said it or not, okay? We don't know if he actually said it or not. It's credited to him. Um, but I don't really care because it proved my point, okay? I want to come back to it for a second. Um, this is what Napoleon maybe, potentially, might have said about China, okay? China's a sleeping giant. He called this back in the you know, 1800s. Let her sleep, for when she awakes, she will shake the world. And he saw potential in this country because it's vast size and it's resources. Man, when she wakes, it's going to shake the world. And I wanna borrow the words from Napoleon. And <clears throat> they might even not be Napoleon's words, so I'm not, I'm not even borrowing anything. I'm just, I read this, and I thought, I wanna rephrase this for us. And I thought maybe this would be a fitting way to close out this series. The church, the church is a sleeping giant. Let her awaken for when we follow, we will shake the world. We will shake the world in the best possible way unleashing the kind of good that shows the world just how good our heavenly Father is and how good the good news and the way of our King Jesus actually is. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I pray and then in this moment, you'd begin to stir something inside of us. That maybe today, as much as it depends on us, the church here 
it would awaken. And you would begin to unleash the kind of good that shows just how good you are. Father, I pray you'd impress upon our hearts how indispensable we are to the body. I pray you would give everybody in this room, no matter who they are, where they are, where they currently are in life, I pray that you would impress upon them in their spirit right now in this moment that they are an indispensable part of the body. We just have to choose to be available, to surrender and to say, I'm gonna play my part. I'm gonna unleash the good and I'm going to ensure the sleeping giant wakes up. And as we do, God, I pray starting right here where we are, it would begin to shake the world in the best possible way. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.